Good morning. The meditation for this morning is found in your bulletin. God, our provider, grant me the wisdom to discern opportunities before me and the faith to follow your way that I might always do what pleases you. And this is from our daily bread. Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. Happy are those whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy, Happy are, are those, those who, whom, whom the Lord, Lord imputes no iniquity, iniquity and in whose spirit, spirit there, there is no deceit. deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will, I will instruct, instruct you and teach, teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with a bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Our hymn of preparation is 40 Days and 40 Nights, which is found in the Red Hymnal, Pilgrim Hymnal, 148. Please stand if you are comfortable and able. Please join me in the invocation and the Lord's Prayer, printed in your bulletin. Divine One, we are thankful for the restoration that can be found in you. Your presence is welcome here. We delight in knowing that you want to be wherever we are. Because you are love, you show up for us. In this space, 
May we delight in your assurance that all you made is good. We pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen be seated. Good morning again. I'd like to thank Susan for taking my spot last week. With I had laryngitis and um, it's not quite gone yet so if you hear my voice crack a little that's that's what all that was. Thank you. What? Oh Don took it. Thank you Don. You're the best. <laughs> so that's why I sound a little off. Um, Welcome. It's so nice to see all these fresh, shiny faces on this cold, chilly weekend. We're looking forward to a snowy New England week this week. Um, and I think we might even have a day off from school or two. Um, the flowers on the altar are by Kathy and Tony. Thank you so much. Please join us in Fellowship Hall. Um, Kathy and Kathy and Kathy are hosting. Kathy and Tony, I think, are hosting. It says Kathy and Kathy. <laughs> um, please sign up for coffee uh, downstairs in Fellowship Hall. The sign up sheet is next to the kitchen door. Um, there are nobody listed for flowers um, for the next two weeks, and then we have one person, then we have another spot. So most of March is open if you'd like to sign up for flowers. Uh, or at, at any time, there's lots of spots open this year. Um, and the sign up for that is in the Narthex. Uh, this Wednesday, March 1st, begins the ecumenical, ecumenical Lenten Bible study series, commonly called Soup and Scripture, at the First Congregational Church, which is on Rock Street in Fall River. The study is going to be the wedding feast of C at Cana and will be taught by Reverend Don Bliss. Soup and bread will be served at 6 p.m., followed by a brief worship service. The study begins at 7 p.m., and the schedule is in the narthex. If you'd like a copy of the schedule, we have copies in the narthex as well. Please let Kathy Frazier or Don Souza know if you need a ride. We've all been invited to a Lenten Taze service called Come Follow Abraham's Stars from stars to Krish, to cross to empty tomb. The story of our redemption um, on tonight, February 26th at uh, 7 p.m. at St. John Newman's in East Freetown. Uh, and the address is on the back of the bulletin. We will have our annual food box challenge. We we're having our annual food box challenge, I believe starting now. Yep. Yay! I texted Scott to bring stuff, but I, I, he has not shown up. So either it's too heavy to carry, or he's not able to make it. I don't know. Um, Non-perishable goods, grocery store gift cards, um, whatever you think is appropriate can be placed in these boxes. And I can tell you um, right now that the need is great. Um, I talked to a friend whose wife volunteers there almost every day, and the need is great. Um, please, please bring in what you, what you can. Please make sure that the expiration dates um, are current. Thank you. We'll be, um, let, please let Reverend Baker know if you're interested in becoming a member. Uh, please let Reverend Baker or Kathy Frazier know if you're interested in working on the renewal of our bylaws. Reverend Baker's blog can be found on his website, which is listed on the back of the bulletin. And he is available on Fridays in his office for anyone who wishes to see him. Please contact him with your request. Are there any other announcements? I think I have some good news 
uh, and that is that I think we have enough people to do our bylaw review. So if you haven't volunteered yet and you've been doing that thing where you kind of cock your head and don't make eye contact because you don't want anyone to see that you're there, I think you're in the clear for now. So um, again, lots going on. I'm excited about the Soup and Scripture series. I'm excited about the Tizay service. And as you might be able to tell from the fact that I have my purple stole on and the fact that we sang something different uh, after the Lord's Prayer, uh, we are in the middle of Lent. Uh, Lent is the season of sort of... Uh, confession and reflection so things may not be quite as lively at least in terms of the music moving forward although not not too bad and so it is this time of um in this season that we now lift up our joys and our concerns we have continued prayers today for susan lemos and for mary and for leon codworth senior and for tiff vonica and for kim for Millie Moore, uh, for Nick Riccardi, and for Paul and Moreno, uh, for uh, Bethany Costa, uh, for Bobby Files, and for Jack, uh, for Franklin McMullen, um, for David Rizuski, uh, and for Curtis Diaz and his wife Naomi. Uh, I did have some good some good news. I talked uh, talked to Krista this week, and uh, she is home after her um, embolism. So she is on that roller coaster of recovery, but she seems to be on the mend for now, and we hope that she is you know, back on her feet um, in, in the next little while, and that she'll be able to join us for worship or, or study and those other things that are going on. Um, talking, thank you. Are there any other prayer requests this morning? Yes. Okay. Anne Marie has her good days and her bad days, and the more we pray, the more good days we hope she has. Yes? So prayers for Beth, who has come down with sepsis, and for her husband, Steve, as we hope for her recovery. Um, this is safe travels for Jeremy and Katie. They, they went to Illinois, and they're driving home with a new puppy. They oh, no. Oh. Safe travels. I was looking at the map right now. That's a long way, but... Excellent. So safe travels for Jeremy and Katie and for their new puppy. Other prayers? Yeah. Yep. Um, a few things. I want to update quick on my sister Mary. Um, she's home. Um, she's she's a cat with nine lives, and um, she's got to stop spending them. So she is home. She's um, not particularly comfortable, but she's up and walking around. She has a nurse come in a couple of times a week. Um, but she was sitting there saying, you know, I, I don't understand why they won't let me go back to work a few hours a day. I mean, Don knows Mary. She's, this is not unexpected. <laughs> I just want them to get me back to work. Get five surgeries two weeks ago. Um, so she's obviously doing really well, and I'm super, super proud of her, and she's my hero. Um, also, my Aunt Carol had a stroke yesterday, so if you wouldn't mind praying for Carol. Um, and for those of you who, who have not seen, and I, I forgive me, I don't know his last name, but Gino, um, who worked at juniors for many many years uh, passed away um, I believe it was last week and there's a big sign in front of juniors to um, to sign the board if you want to sign the board um, and if you've lived in in Freetown you've probably had a sandwich made by Gino at least once um, he was an amazing person who was just um, had a smile for every person every person you ever met um, that's that's all I think all right, thank you. Other prayer requests this morning? Yes. President Jimmy Carter. So President Carter, uh, he is still in hospice, is that correct? Okay. Wasn't sure if I missed any news this morning. Other prayer requests this morning? Then let us all join together 
as one community in prayer. God, we do not observe Ash Wednesday at this church, but as we begin our Lenten journey, we must take its lessons to heart. You teach us that we were formed from dust, and to dust we shall return. We are not invincible. We are not perfect. As long as we think we are, as long as we put other things before you, we drift away. Call us back. Help us to remember things. Help us to be sorry. Help us to free ourselves from fear and resentment <clears throat> and resignation. Pull the weight off our backs and <clears throat> help us to recognize your love and forgiveness. Help us to live our lives in gratitude for your grace and glory. When we, forgive our, when we confess our sins, we recognize the world is larger than our own concerns, and we pray for relief for the suffering of others. We pray for those who are prevented from loving you by their greed and anger. We pray for wisdom and compassion for those in power. We pray for those who face abuse and injustice. We pray for those who seek to help others and to sacrifice for their benefit. We pray for all people who have lost homes or businesses in disasters. We pray for those who mourn and pray for those who face uh, death in the near future. We pray for those facing illness and injury and surgery and chronic conditions like cancer. We pray especially for Susan, for Mary, for Leon, for Tiff and Vaughn and Kim, for Millie and Nick, for Paul and Moreno, for Bethany and Bobby, for Jack and Krista, for Franklin and David, for Naomi and Anne-Marie, for Beth, for Carol, for President Carter, for Gino's family, and for Jeremy and Kate and their new family member. Hear now the silent prayers of our hearts, for we have more to say and more to confess than we desire to say in front of others. And in our silence, let us open our hearts to hear the word of grace you have for us today. Let us keep a moment of silence. Lord, hear our prayer and give us a clean heart so we may serve you. Amen. May those who wish please come forward. So today is the first Sunday in Lent, and for Lent this year, I wanted to do something different, hopefully something that is moving to you. And every Sunday in Lent, I want to place a different item on our communion table to remind us of what fasting really means. So for today, I brought bag of food. This is fresh food from the grocery store. I didn't just pull it out of my pantry. I'm going to place it right here. And it's going to end up in that box. So they already put the exact identical bag in the other three boxes. And as you may know, these food boxes, there's a competition. So whichever box for each aisle, whichever food box gets the most food in that box wins. What do they win? Well, that remains to be seen, but it's probably just right there. So I'm putting my food here uh, to the beginning of the season to remind us that food is something that is necessary for us. And that when we give food away to others who are hungry, that is a form of fasting. We give something up from us 
for the sake of others, so that we may learn to let God into our hearts. And so each, each day, on each Sunday, I'm going to bring something different, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the new uh, opportunity to give in different ways. And so today is we're going to give to the uh, annual, to the uh, Somerset Food Bank. That was Somerset, uh, New Street Bank. Yeah, Street Bank. Yeah. Yeah. I live in Somerset, that's what I got. Yeah, nice try. The Freetown uh, Food Bank is something that we give to regularly, but each, each Sunday we're going to give you an opportunity to give something new. And uh, we'll usually take a collection for that uh, in the following week. Uh, again, we got a lot going on. We have our church to keep, you know, keep a roof over our heads. And we've got a lot of other concerns at this time of year, especially if the temperature finally thinks about dropping into winter levels for once. So I appreciate anything that you can give, any fast that you can uh, make. Uh, there's a story I heard about uh, a refugee camp in World War II. And there were children there who were either orphaned or were separated from their families. And they were very afraid. And they didn't know whether or not they had anything to eat from one day to the next. Um, and so the people who were in the camp gave them a piece of bread every night before they went to bed. The reason they did this wasn't because they needed the food, because they already been fed that day. But it was a reminder that more food was available, more food was coming. And just having that security to know that they weren't alone, that they weren't bereft of the necessities of life, let them sleep that night. So when we think about our food, not only is it delicious, it's also a reminder that we are not alone, that we receive that uh, food through the labor and the love of others. And we know that, that it reminds us not only that we are not alone in our world, but we are not alone in our relationship to God. So let us say a prayer and repeat please after me. Dear Lord, thank you for food. Thank you for food. Thank you that we are not alone. Thank you that we are not alone. Please bless this food. Please bless this food. That we may share it with others. That we may share it with others. That they will know. They will know. Our love. Our love. And your love. Amen. Amen. So God gives us good things. So let us give good things to God. Let us bring gifts that can be like water in dry places, like food for those who are worried about not having any. And may the resources that we give be used to testify to the goodness of God. This morning's offering will now be received.
Let us pray. Divine One, receive our gifts from the open hearts from which we give them. Thank you for blessing us with the gifts to share so that good works may abound. We offer our gifts gladly. May we give may what we give be used to meet the needs of all. Amen. You may be seated. Now is the time in our church service where we sing our hymn of preparation, and normally you're all standing when we sing our hymn of preparation. But today I want to try something a very little bit different. The hymn we're going to sing is the, from the Black New Century Hymnal. It's number 188, and it's called Give Me a Clean Heart. Now if you look at the music, you might notice there's only one verse. And so what we're going to do is we're going to sing the song three times. And rather than stand up and, and put your head down while you're standing, I want you to sort of sit in your seats and sort of let the music wash over you as you sing it a few times so that you can really feel um, and open yourself to open, cleaning your heart and being ready to uh, receive God's love. So let us now sit and all sing, Give Me a Clean Heart. <coughs> scripture lesson is Genesis 2:15 through 17 and 2 excuse me 3 1 through 6 1 through 7 The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to keep it I apologize. Thank you. 
The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now that the ser serpent was more crafty, now the serp serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Our gospel lesson is Matthew 4, 1 through 11, which is found on pages 704 through 705 in your pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will be not dashed from your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Good morning again. Perhaps one of these days I'll have everything electrically done so I don't have to juggle books and papers. But then I think that would sort of lose part of the charm, don't you? So I have a question for you today, and that is, what is your weakness? What is the one thing that is holding you back from being the person that you want to be? I think this is very important to ask ourselves as we enter into the season of Lent. Because this is the season of self-reflection. So when we step back during the last months of winter, or I guess the first months of winter, to force ourselves to think about what we will do once spring and Easter arrive. Now Lent is hard. And it's because we're not used to self-reflection. You know, we're used to facing the daily challenges of life and then maybe enjoying ourselves once those challenges are met. We don't always have the time or the inclination to, to stop, to examine what we're doing, 
and why we're doing it. So Lent means doing different things in different places. And here in church, Lent means that we pull out the purple paraments and we listen to music in minor keys. We stop singing about the glory of God and we start instead of asking God for the mercy that we need. But outside of church, things are different. I went to the grocery store uh, this week to get some groceries for myself, but also for, uh, for our friends that are in need in our community. And I didn't see a lot of penitential stuff in the grocery store. I saw a lot of jelly beans and peeps and chocolate eggs and little duckies and bunnies and pastel colors all preparing us for Easter. Now, maybe on the side, maybe at one little end cap, there was a splash of bright green and a couple of leprechauns, or maybe some of those, those hats with the, you know, um, you know the, the horseshoe on them. None of these signs invite us to reflect. If anything, they invite us to indulge ourselves with candy or with beer or other celebratory activities that are fun in the short term, but perhaps not so healthy in the long term. So again, I ask, what is your weakness? What is holding you back? How are you a target for behaviors and ideas that keep you away from God and away from being your best self? Let's think about that candy for a minute. Because I have so many favorites. I love the jelly beans. I like the Brock's Spice jelly beans because you can only get them this time of year. I like the, the Cadbury uh, eggs with the crisp candy shell. Not a big fan of the, uh, the cream eggs, but so many wonderful candies at this time of year. And I think that candy is a delightful treat. I'm not sure that you've noticed this, but I try to make sure we have some candy on hand almost every single Sunday including this one. Uh, you might notice that there are some nice chocolates out by the, by the door that are left over from Valentine's Day. I know that they're still good. But I think there's a big difference between maybe grabbing a small piece of chocolate uh, in, on your way into church and then having a lot of sweets in your house, from having something to sh that's part of a communal experience and having, say, a five-pound bag of uh, sour gummy worms. Candy and other foods filled with empty calories can be a weakness for me. You know, I lost a lot of weight during the pandemic, and after regaining some of it back, I tried to lose, uh, lose it again in preparation for my trip to California last February. You know, I was going to Disneyland, and I knew there'd be a lot of walking and a lot of tight seats on the rides, and I wanted to enjoy myself without being cramped or exhausted. But as often is the case, once I got back home and, and you know, once we got back into the swing of things, the weight slowly crept back on. You know, I try to go to the gym every day. In fact, I saw Linda there on Wednesday. But it's hard to do it every day because it closes, it closes early on Sundays, and I'm usually busy on Sunday mornings. I didn't know if you knew that about me. And then I might be a little tired on Mondays, or maybe I have a nagging injury. I think I pulled a muscle in my foot on Wednesday, so I haven't been back since. And, you know, then I have to skip a day. And then I look at my watch, and it tells me all the little rings. And I said, oh, I'm not going to get that perfect wheat. I'm not going to get that little trophy. Eh. I'm not, it's not going to be perfect. I might as well skip another day. And then maybe another day. You know, i got to do something that evening. I'm busy. i got to do something. And before you know it, it's been months since I go to the gym. It's just one excuse after the other. And when I'm not focused on my health, it's easy to let my appetite take over. You know, sometimes I'm pretty busy, especially at night with my kids. They're teenagers. You know, they're, they're getting ready to go to college, and it's difficult to get in a healthy meal on the table on those busy nights. And so sometimes we settle for something quick, like pizza. And sometimes my family wants something like pasta. Uh, my daughter Rosa loves penne alla vodka. It's her favorite, so I have to make that sometimes. And sometimes, maybe I'm really busy and I say, you know what, I'm gonna grab a nice meal for myself in the middle of the day 
I'll just do something light for dinner. And then I get home and Rosa says, can I please have penny ala vodka? Or, you know what, I feel like Chinese today. And I, okay, and then I have another large meal. You know, I don't want to be a killjoy. Don't want to tell my family, well, actually, I already ate something. You're going to have to eat something else. It, I, I want to make sure they get to eat the foods that they enjoy, but also I don't want to miss out on those foods because, I, you know, I like those foods as well. It kind of triggers sort of a silly uh, FOMO reaction in me. Who knows what FOMO means? What does FOMO mean? Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out, that's right. It's the sense that others are enjoying something and that you're going to miss it if you don't participate in what they're doing. You don't want to be excluded from the group. That sense of being excluded from a group is very, very powerful to our psychology. You know, maybe there's a, a product or a piece of entertainment that gets great reviews and you don't want to miss it. And then there are those products. There's something is only for a limited time or you go to, to the website and it says only two left. And you say, well, I was thinking of getting it, maybe not getting it, but if there's only two left, I got to buy it, I might miss out. You know, it's the act now. You know, whenever I put up um, a reflection on uh, the websites on Wednesday, I turn into our free website and there's always a sign saying final hours, 50% off, upgrade to premium. And I'm like, it tells me that they're in the final hours every week for three years. You know, I feel this way about food sometimes. There's this beautiful thing. I, I, I just don't want to miss out on that flavor. But it's an excuse. I tell myself, oh, I don't want to waste food, so I clean my plate. I go to a buffet, and oh, I need to try everything, especially the desserts. What if I miss something great? Don't want to insult the people that made the food, that I'm not choosing their meal. I better try everything. You know, and then there's candy left over in the house from holidays. And so I look at the candy and I say, well, I'm going to eat it sooner or later. Might as well just eat it all now. And then there's that force of habit. For example, I might want to munch on chips or gummy bears while I'm writing on my computer, used to grabbing something while I work. And then I like to share popcorn with my kids when we watch TV together. Well, we can't watch TV without popcorn. And eventually my stomach gets so used to being full that whenever I have a reasonable amount of food that day, it starts grumbling, and I feel like I'm starving myself. And maybe I have a little extra treat after dinner, and maybe another treat after that. So there's all this stuff going on. We have social pressures. We have ease of availability. We have bad habits, and all more, and all these things conspire against me. And so even when I look in the mirror, and I feel my pants digging into my gut, I say, oh, I gotta do it. I'm such a bad person. But the guilt never gets past the positive experiences or the, the feeling of resignation that I have later in the day. I ultimately get out and say, Ugh, one more snack isn't going to hurt. It all goes back to weaknesses. The way I look at it, we can have lots of different kind of weaknesses, but this is a sermon and we always do things in three, so we're going to say there are three types of weaknesses. There are weaknesses in our heads, weaknesses in our hearts, and weaknesses in our guts. And in my case, in this particular example, my weakness is in my gut. It tells me that I'm hungry and that food tastes good, even if it may not be healthy for me. And then my heart tells me that I'm gonna feel bad if I overeat. But then it feels so good doing it that I ignore what my heart says. And then my head tells me to do the right things about calories and about cholesterol and all this other stuff, about how good I'm gonna feel if, I, if I'm able to do this. But then my head also gives me excuses why I don't need to do it. In any case, it always stems from my gut. It's what's dictating everything else. But if I can get back into those patterns of exercise, my foot doesn't hurt, and keep those snacks away, I can, my head and my heart can get my gut back into line. Hopefully that's how it's gonna work. But there's always other things besides eating that might touch my heart or touch my head and get in the way of doing what I think is best for me or what God thinks is best for me. There's always gonna be some weakness. 
Okay. So let's look at our Bible stories and see what they have to say about weakness. So what about Eve, or more precisely, the woman, since she's only named Eve later in the story? So what about Eve? I think there was a movie about that once. It was all about Eve. Okay. So what was Eve's weakness? I think you could argue that it was her head. Well, she had, she had, her problem was ultimately one with eating, but it wasn't related to her gut because she had all the food that she could ever eat. And it's also not relating to her heart. There's nothing particularly emotionally appealing about the fruit, even though it is described in the Bible as a delight to the eyes. The problem was with Eve's head. She was curious. And that's how the serpent was able to convince her to sin against God. You know, the, the serpent preys upon Eve's imagination of what might be possible. And she gets that FOMO stayed into her head. She says to herself, what will I miss out if I don't eat the fruit? What might I never know? Well, shouldn't I want to expand my mind and be wise? Do I want to be stupid my whole life? And so when she listens to what her head says and all the excuses that the serpent put in there, that's when she breaks her word and she eats the fruit and she shares it with Adam. The serpent found her weakness and exploited it. Remember last week I said it was rare to talk about heaven in a mainline church like ours? All right, see a couple heads nodding. Well, it's even rarer for us to talk about the devil. So, for the sake of argument, let us say that the devil is that which invites us to turn away from God. This could be a sentient demonic creature, you know, maybe with horns and a pitchfork. It could be an impersonal force. It could be a metaphor for evil. It could be a personification of, of personal and social factors. Regardless of how we might define what the devil is, we can see him as preying upon our weaknesses, getting us at our most vulnerable places. He brings out the worst in us. But the devil is unable to get at Jesus, even when Jesus is at his most vulnerable. You know, in the st we, told, we heard this, this story today about Jesus fasting in the wilderness. He'd been there for 40 days when the devil comes to him. And the devil looks at the stones on the ground and he tells Jesus to use his miraculous powers to feel, feed himself, to silence that churning in his gut and all those brain chemicals that are demanding that he eat something. But Jesus says, the word of God is more important than bread. And so, gut didn't work, let's try the heart. The devil attacks Jesus' heart. He, he tempts Jesus to throw himself off of the tower and then to use his power to save himself. To give him to that sense of fear at that dangerous moment or the sense of personal invincibility. I don't have to worry about this, I'll be safe. But Jesus will not be put to the test. And so finally, the devil tries to go after Jesus' head. The gospel says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, you might think this is the least tempting of all because, you know, it's ridiculous. You know, why would Jesus want to worship Satan? That doesn't make any sense. But Jesus had a purpose in coming to the world. He wanted to save people. He wanted to heal and comfort people. He wanted to teach them the truth about God. He wanted them to repent and to turn their lives around and to be good people, to do the things that they were supposed to do. But actually getting people to want to change, getting people to you know, want to help others, that's difficult. And so when we want to get people to do what we want them to do, we might try to manipulate them. We might try to coerce them, the old stick instead of the carrot. Sometimes we may even use violence to get them to do what we think is the right thing for them to do. And when we decide that we're going to take these shortcuts to try to get what we want as soon as possible, that's when we act like the devil. Because to worship the devil is not to perform some you know, ritual praising him. 
It's to follow his methods, the ways that people normally do things, the ways that act as the master of the world would do. And because from a logical standpoint, this makes sense that Jesus would want to get us to do what's good for us in any way possible. But Jesus does not follow Satan's methods. Jesus says that he will worship and serve only God. Because God does not exploit our physical needs or our fears or our desires or our logic to get us where we are supposed to be. God calls us to a higher place, to put aside those feelings and to find the bigger picture. And that picture is that love is more powerful than any sense of expediency. And Jesus knew this. He didn't go out to the wilderness to weaken himself so that the devil could get him. He went out to strengthen himself, to get used to silencing his gut and his heart and his head so that by the time the devil came, nothing could touch him. Jesus took that time, those 40 days, to reflect, to understand himself, to maybe change his perspectives mentally and emotionally and physically. And after mastering his weaknesses, he was then able to teach others how to master theirs. No shortcuts, no loopholes. One more time, let me ask, what is your weakness? It might be your gut. You might be used to doing things a certain way. And your body may ache or scream at you to just keep doing those things the way that you always did them. You know, so if you want to get past that gut weakness, you may have to move out of the regular patterns. You may have to force your body or your brain to accept something new. You know, your weakness may be your heart. You may be afraid, afraid of missing out on something or that maybe something might be taken away from you. You're terrified of losing something. And so instead of trying to fulfill these desires or to silence those fears, we need to take a step back, recontextualize, and think about what is really behind them. Why am I feeling this way? Finally, your weakness may be your head. You might think that things need to be a certain way. You may think that the world must conform to certain principles. You may want to conform to the ideas and activities of others. It's that conforming mechanism that's very powerful. But as Eve taught us, this may be the most difficult thing to overcome because the head is supposed to control everything else, right? But God calls us beyond our heads. God touches our souls. And God quiets our doubts and our fears and our impulses to help us see a love that is more than just our own satisfaction. And this leads us back to Lent. Jesus fasted to quiet his gut, to allow his mind and his soul to speak to him. And we need to do the same. Now I'm going to try to eat less and exercise more, not only during Lent, but, to move for, but moving forward. And I'm going to accept that for a meal or for a day, I might not meet my goal. And I'm not going to see that as a surrender to just give up on everything. I need to face my weakness, knowing that with God I might be able to overcome it. And because I just spent the last 20 minutes confessing my weaknesses to you, I think I might be able to hold myself more accountable because you'll be judging me if I don't, right? That's why confession is important. So during Lent, I want you to think about how you are going to fast. You know, maybe food related. You might decide to eat less. You may give up meat on Fridays. You might say, no more sweets for me for the next couple of weeks. You know, it, it might be putting aside things, non-food related things that are destructive or distracting. It may mean giving things away that you might fear to lose. It may be trying a new way of looking at things. I'm going to try thinking about the world this way, just for 40 days and see how it goes. Through fasting or confessing or being more generous in our thoughts and actions, we prepare ourselves for all the fun and all the joy that's going to come 
at Easter. A beauty that is going to be more than just pale pastels and is more satisfying than candy. Easter is the transformation that God calls us towards. And now is the time to confront our weaknesses and to get ready. Let us pray. God, we are sorry for the ways we have failed you. Help us to confess and to receive your pardon. Help us to see our weaknesses and find ways to always come back to you. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is once again from the Red Pilgrim Hymnal. It is number 153, Lord, who throughout these 40 days. And since this is our response to the world and our preparations to go out into the world, once again, we will stand, if you're comfortable and able to do so, and we're all going to sing together. So now as you depart from this space and enter out into the wilderness of the world, know that God is with you. Whatever may come, let God be your safe place, that bread in your hand, and know that God is with you and that you are never alone. Amen. Let us all turn and sing together, Blessed be the tie that binds. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that of